Hi. Hey, James. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Belgrade. Thank you. <laughs> nice to have you here. So, how do you like it so far? Yeah, the weather is much better than England. Oh, yeah, moment, I so. bet so. Um, yes. There is one little thing about you. You actually remember time before Stack Overflow. I do, yes. Oh. I'm that old, right? I do remember the time before. It was very hard, so you didn't get, you weren't very productive. Uh huh. So you were able to learn like C? <laughs> yeah, I taught myself C from a book. Can you yes, imagine? From a book, from a guys. Book, that's right? that from thing with papers, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so welcome, and here you are. All right, thank you very much. So, um, hello, everybody. My name's James Thomas. I'm a developer advocate for IBM working in our cloud division. I'm actually the lead serverless advocate for IBM Cloud. Uh, and the title of my talk today is this, right? Serverless, the missing manual. Because I want to talk around about some of the areas around building service applications, service architectures, that I don't think get enough attention when people are kind of talking about it online. And it's areas where I've seen developers repeatedly struggle with when they attempt to kind of migrate applications over to these new service platforms. So my talk is called The Missing Manual. I'm going to help to try and fill in some of the gaps that you might have around broader cloud services and capabilities that you are going to need to be productive when you're using what we call serverless cloud platforms. And the actual the, the inspiration for this talk is me kind of doing uh, this kind of thing for about the past two years. So for the past two years, an advocate, I've been kind of traveling around on stage uh, like this, um, talking to developers, trying to get them excited about serverless and serverless cloud platforms. And I started to notice something interesting, right? When I'd kind of finished my talk or my workshop or my meetup, developers would have lots of really good questions about serverless cloud platforms. But they weren't asking necessarily what I thought they would ask about. They weren't asking about the kind of what I call the functions as a service component. They could kind of understand the basics. Where most of their questions came from was in their head kind of struggling to translate what I call traditional application architectures over to this new kind of serverless world that we live in. Uh, and they had some really, really good questions. And so this kind of inspired me to do this talk to kind of talk about some of the things they were asking about. And I'm actually going to go through the five most common questions that people ask me about service, because the same questions come up again and again and again. So I'm going to go through the five most common questions. I'm going to give you the answer, right? I'm going to give you the answer. And I'm also going to step back and kind of think about why are people asking this question? What is it about serverless that kind of found it difficult? So what do you think, right? What do you think the most common question people might ask me about serverless is? I can tell you it's not, why is it called serverless? Don't you know that it uses servers? Although people do tell me that a lot, and I think it's slightly more of a statement than a question. No, it turns out the most common question people ask me after my talks or after my meetups, this comes up 95% of the time, is this, right? Where do I store my files in a serverless application or serverless web application? And when I talk to these developers, they're kind of coming from the background of building what I call traditional three-tier web applications, where they have some kind of infrastructure, they have a kind of web server, web app server on there, and they have their static assets, their HTML, their JavaScript, their CSS they need to serve to the client. And when I'm talking about serverless and saying you don't get any access to the infrastructure whatsoever, they think, well, where do I put those files? Where do I, you know, how do I access the file system to be able to serve those assets? And it's a really, really good question. And the answer is, if you're building kind of what we call serverless web apps or any kind of cloud native app, Generally, what you're going to do is you're going to use services called object stores from your cloud provider, which kind of provide elastic storage in the cloud. And I think it's a kind of serverless approach where with object stores, you kind of upload your files to the cloud, and then you can kind of access them on demand. And you don't have to manage what we call the storage devices. You don't think about the, the hard drives, the SANs, or any of that kind of stuff. You just kind of upload it, you access your files on demand, and then you get charged at the end of the month based on usage. And all cloud providers, whoever you use, IBM, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, whoever, they all have this kind of object store service. So on IBM Clouds, we have one originally named IBM Cloud Object Storage, um, which is a kind of storage service you're going to use for service applications on IBM Cloud um, or any kind of cloud native application. And object stores, as a kind of category of service from your cloud provider, have a number of benefits for service apps or any kind of cloud app over a kind of traditional file system, kind of traditional storage infrastructure. And they have advantages like these, right? The first is that you get what are called unlimited storage, right? It's only limited by your ability to pay for it. 
you're going to upload your files, and then at the end of the month when you access them, you get charged based on usage. So how much data you're storing, how many requests you're making, and the amount of bandwidth you are using, right? Which is it's a kind of serverless approach. You get charged on usage, not on capacity you reserve. You don't have a fixed amount of storage. You have to provision up front, and when it's full, it's full. Another different about kind of difference about object stores is how you access those files in your application. With object stores, your files are available over just a normal HTTP interface so you can get and put and post to kind of interact with them. With traditional storage infrastructure, right, you would call like read file and that would go to the kernel, which goes to the block device on your kind of hard drive or something like that. With object stores, you can just get a normal HTTP interface to interact with your files. And normally, the cloud provider, there's a nice client library that you can use for S3 or something like that to make it easy to use. And the fact that your files, your objects, are now available through just a normal HTTP interface has a number of kind of really nice side benefits for building kind of serverless applications. The first of these is that you can make your objects public. So if you're building one of these serverless web applications and you have JavaScript and CSS and HTML that you want to serve to your clients, rather than the client having to call your service function, which then goes and talks to the object store, which returns that data and renders it to a client, because they're available on a HTTP interface, you can make those objects, those files, what we call public, and the client can access them directly because it's just a HTTP endpoint. And it means you don't have to call your service function to do the rendering, which is a much more efficient, faster, and cheaper way to be able to do this. And you can actually take this approach much, much further by allowing clients to upload files directly to your storage infrastructure. So for example, if you're building a serverless app which we had to accept big video files being uploaded to your backend, rather than the client having to call the service function with like a huge video file which uploads it to your object store. All you can do is you can give your clients what we call temporary credentials, pre-signed URLs. Then those clients can upload them directly to the HTTP interface, that endpoint, and you get a notification when you're finished, which is, again, a much nicer, faster, more efficient way to do it, and is a kind of side benefit of having your files available on a kind of HTTP endpoint. So this question, right, of where do I store my files in a kind of serverless application, got no access to the infrastructure, no access to the file system, is a really, really good one. It's kind of really uh, kind of intuitive of why people will ask this. And the answer is relatively straightforward. Generally, when you're building any kind of cloud native app, any kind of serverless app, you're going to go and use an object store as your kind of elastic storage in the cloud. Now, the second question, the second most popular question I get asked, again, comes up about 90% of the time. And I think this is a, is a slight variation on that first question. Uh, and the second question is this, right? How do I install my database? in a serverless kind of runtime of service application. And again, I think people asking me this question come from a background where they have a kind of web application, where they have some kind of infrastructure, and they have the web server on there, and they have their assets. But then they manually, on that infrastructure, install and manage the database. Uh, and then the application connects to it over local host or something like that. And with serverless, right, no access to the infrastructure. You can't access a runtime environment, can't install the database. So where would you, what do you kind of do for databases if you're building serverless applications. And because I think this, vary, this question is a slight variation on the first um, question, my answer is quite similar, is that generally, if you need a database for serverless application, you're going to go and use what I call managed database services from your cloud providers. We go to Cloud Providers Console, you click a couple of buttons, you get the connection string for that database, and you just use a client library to talk to it. Generally, what you don't do is you don't go and like create a VM and install Linux, install MySQL, then hire a DBA that you keep in the basement to look after it. You don't generally do that. You want to get away from kind of managing infrastructure and use managed services wherever possible. And managed database services have a number of, uh, of kind of benefits for service applications over kind of managing those, those kind of services yourself. The first is that there's no maintenance, right? Service is all about managed services. So you don't have to, to maintain the infrastructure or the databases. You can get rid of that DBA in the basement because you don't need them anymore. You're just going to let the cloud provider do everything for you. And also, what I call the billing model is generally more serverless-like, where you get charged based on usage, not on a fixed amount of capacity you have to reserve. So if you're you know, running your own databases, you normally have a fixed amount of space that you have. And uh, if it's full, it's full. With managed database services, you normally just get charged at the end of the month based on usage. So if you follow my advice, right, you're going to go and create your serverless app, and you're going to go and use kind of managed database services, the next question you will have is like, well, which one 
do I use? Because if you go to a cloud provider's console, and this is kind of a screenshot of the database section IBM Cloud, you can see you have a huge amount of choice. Right? You've got MySQL, Mongo, Redis, Postgres, like even DB2. For all of you DB2 fans in the audience, um, IBM Cloud is the place to go. Uh, and you, with a couple of clicks of a button, you can kind of provision these services. So the question is, like, which one is best to use for a service application? Because it might not be the one that you are most familiar with. So I'm going to give you two new things to think about when you're provisioning managed services like databases to use in service applications to kind of consider which one is going to be most appropriate. And the two things to think about are event support and scalability, right? Event support and scalability. So what do I mean by this? Well, if you're building a kind of, let's say you're building some APIs with serverless, a uh, kind of serverless backend, you get an API request has come in, it's going to kick off your service function, uh, which is going to go and then talk to the database. You could use any of those databases from that kind of serverless function. You're going to get a connection string, you're going to get a client library, you're going to go and uh, you're going to go and talk to it, and that would be absolutely fine. But as you're building what we call serverless applications, often you want to build kind of what we call event-driven architectures, where as well as you, some API requests kicking off your function, which talks manually to the database, you want your service functions to listen to changes in those databases and be kicked off automatically. So when a new user gets added to a user database, you want your service function to send them an email automatically kicked off. And because of the way serverless platforms work, you can't have your service function sat there idle, just polling that database for changes. It has to be kicked off automatically by the platform. And if you go and look at the managed database services and other application services, only a small subset of those you can provision will have that deep event integration with your serverless cloud platform. So this is something you need to think about, right? How do you want your service functions invoked? If you're going to kick them off manually with an API request, you use any of those databases. But if you want them listening to things like database changes, it's going to be a smaller subset that you're going to provision and use. And then secondly, scalability. This is really, really important, right? One of the benefits of serverless is that you can cope with loads of traffic really, really easily. You know, a thousand requests come in, your service cloud platform just spins up multiple instances of your functions in parallel to handle them. But with serverless, all of those individual functions are going to be running in their own runtime environment, and they're going to be making their own connection to that downstream data source, that downstream database. And many traditional, for, for example, SQL databases were built in a time where you would have one connection from your application to the database and kind of multiplex requests back and forth. And with serverless, now you're going to have you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of concurrent connections, and it can completely overwhelm that downstream data source. So you need to think about whether the, the kind of connection scalability profile of your application and whether the database is going to cope with that connection traffic. And these two factors, right, event support and scalability, are actually really, really important to think about when you're provisioning any kind of application service, whether it's a database or a message queue or a cache for use with serverless. And these are kind of two new things to think about. Now, those first two questions, I think, are kind of slight variations of the same, right, where you're going to use kind of managed services for different application components. The third question is slightly different, but also really, really interesting. And it's this, right? Can I use Framework X with serverless, where traditionally people are talking about frameworks like Ruby on Rails or Django or Spring Boots, these big traditional web application frameworks. And when people ask me this, right, can I, how do I deploy my Rails app on serverless? I normally give what I call a very short and simple answer. Like, no, you can't do this. It's not really possible, nor is it a good idea. But when I say this to people, you know, people are very attached to their frameworks. They start to get sad. They start to tear up a little bit. Uh, and I don't want to make developers feel sad. I'm supposed to make them feel happy. So I kind of thought about, like, well, why do I say this? Why do I say you can't really bring your web, app, uh, web application frameworks over to this new service world. Like what, do, like, what do you need frameworks for anyway? For those developers, like, what are you using them for? How do they make you productive? And I think if we look at those big web application frameworks, right, like they, regardless of the particular language you're using, I think there's a number of common tasks that they all kind of take care to make you productive. And it's things like this, right? I think they all do kind of scaffolding and boilerplate. You can type in new commands and get an application spun up really, really quickly. That's kind of useful. Normally, the framework will listen to HTTP requests coming in and work out which bit of your application to call, the kind of URL routing. They normally make it easy to set up authentication with external providers across all your kind of API endpoints. That's good. 
And then most of them seem to have some kind of plug-in architecture where you can use community modules to add in common features that you need, like rate limiting and cores to kind of protect all of your request handlers so you don't have to do it manually. Uh, and also service credentials, right? We know, we know, hopefully, you know it's a bad idea to hard code usernames and passwords all over your application. So normally, the frameworks have some way where you can give the framework the credentials, and it kind of injects those into your runtime environment. And finally, what I call packaging and deployment. You can normally type one command, spin up the whole web application locally for testing and development, and then also generate your deployment package, your WAR, your JAR, your ZIP, whatever you use to push over to your production infrastructure. But if we look at all of these tasks, right? Like the question is, what do frameworks mean in a new serverless world? Are all of those things really still the domain of me, the developer, or some open source code that I have to package? Or actually, do they kind of come baked in with the platform? And it turns out many of those things we use frameworks for are now just kind of baked in with the platform, the kind of platform features that come for free. So for example, if you are building what I call API handlers, where your, you know, an API request comes in, you're going to want to call it to your, your serverless function, the way you expose those functions to the internet is through cloud services we call API gateways. And API gateways do the request handling for you and work out which serverless functions are called. So you don't really need some, some code, some framework to do that. It's taken away. It's managed for you by the cloud. And the nice thing about API gateways is that authentication normally comes built in. So you go in, just check a, check a box, and then authentication is set up with external providers across all of your external API endpoints. Again, with middleware, many of the common middleware kind of projects for things like cores and rate limiting, these are just feature flags in that API gateway. You can just check a box and turn it on. You don't need to manage that in your kind of business logic anymore, which is very nice. And then finally, with regards to service credentials, all service cloud platforms have this capability built in where you can give them your API keys, your service credentials, and it will automatically inject it into the runtime environment using environment variables or something like that. So again, that's another nice thing I don't really have to worry about anymore. So it turns out many of these things, right, they're just not kind of really the domain of the developer. There are still a couple of things which we could have frameworks for to make as productive building serverless applications. That is scaffolding and boilerplate. It's still nice to type one command and have a whole serverless application spun up locally really quickly for development. And then what I call packaging and deployment, right? Still, it can be quite difficult to package up your service app, deploy it to a cloud provider, connect to all the event sources, the API gateway, the configuration, the IAM, all of that kind of stuff. So although those traditional big web app frameworks aren't really kind of relevant anymore, there's still some space for frameworks to help us be productive. And it turns out people have spent lots of time building frameworks for serverless development. So there's lots and lots of different choices available. If you're looking for a tip, this is my tip. Go and check out one called uh, the Serverless Framework. It's just an open source CLI tool that helps you with those two things, with scaffolding and boilerplate and packaging and deployment. Um, this, it's like vastly popular. So it's got like 20 million stars on GitHub. It's the biggest uh, framework for service development out there. And the nice thing about it is what I call multi-vendor. So you can use it with pretty much any big service cloud provider. And it's language agnostic. So it doesn't care about what particular programming language you're using. It's what I use. I really like it. Other service frameworks are available. Go, go kind of check it out. So frameworks is a kind of big topic. I get asked this kind of question a lot. And traditionally, you're not going to be able to use those traditional web app frameworks because many of those features they provided are just kind of giving you to you for free by the platform. But there are still some space for frameworks to help you be productive. Uh, things like service framework are really, really good to check out. OK, so penultimate question now. And this is a kind of super hot topic in the serverless community at the moment, right? How do you debug serverless um, kind of service? How do you debug service functions? This is a big pain point for developers. And I think when people are asking me this question, they're asking me this because they realize the obvious challenge here with serverless cloud platforms, service environments, is that you have no access to the runtime environment. You can't like SSH into your little cloud function and like grep through logs or use top or kind of like connect a debugger to some kind of errant process. So you can't do any of that. All of those tools you have for debugging, which rely on having physical access to the environment, kind of throw them in the bin, can't use them anymore. <laughs> 
But unfortunately, right, if you're using a service platform, I'm going to be still writing the code, which means I'm going to still be writing bugs, right? Still going to have bugs in production, still going to have to debug stuff. So what kind of tools do you have available to you? I'm going to talk you through three tools you've got available, which are going to be your primary ways of kind of debugging apps running on serverless cloud platforms. And the first of those is logs, right? You still have logs available to you. It turns out in your serverless functions, all you have to do is write to standard out or standard error, and all of that logging output is captured automatically by the service platform. It's made available through some kind of platform API, and normally they will send all of those logs over to some kind of external logging service. So you have a nice centralized place in the cloud to go in and search through your whole service logs. And I think this is a much better approach than how traditionally log management has worked, where your application like writes to a file on a disk, you have a cron job, which kind of like rotates it so it doesn't get too big. You have another cron job, which zips them all up and sends them over to some kind of syslog drain. And you have some kind of monitoring infrastructure to make sure all of that stuff is kind of working, which is kind of, uh, kind of slightly nasty. Service is much better. You just write standard out, standard error. It's captured by the platform. And logs are going to be the primary way you're going to be debugging stuff at the moment on service cloud platforms. So it's very, very important to have good logging in your cloud functions. So for example, a little demo. I've got some JavaScript at the top. You can see this is a hello world function that's got some logging lines in there. And when it's executed, you can see the log messages are already captured by the platform, which is very, very nice. And then IBM Cloud, all of your service logs get centralized over to IBM Cloud Logging, which is just managed instance of Kibana. It's what we use for our logging infrastructure. So you've got a nice place to go in and search through all of your service logs that have been generated by the platform. So logs is kind of built in. It's kind of just platform feature that they all give you is kind of built in. You don't have to think about. Another thing that kind of comes built in is some high-level metrics about your service functions being executed. So most platforms record things like what functions are being invoked, when are they being invoked, how long did they take, what did they return, did they return success, did they return errors, stuff around cold starts, if you're kind of familiar with those terms. And again, these are just kind of built in. They're made available through some kind of nice platform API. And normally, the uh, cloud platform will send automatic all of your metrics over to some external logging or metrics monitoring service so you can set up dashboards and monitoring and availability checks and get you out of bed if things start to, to kind of go wrong. And again, this is another thing that's normally built in with the platforms. And you can use these metrics to start to diagnose when you're having issues in your application. So for example, if you suddenly get a huge amount of errors being returned by your functions, something's going wrong in your application. And again, things like duration. If your function suddenly starts to take 10 times as long, maybe those downstream services, those databases, those message queues are struggling to cope with the scale that you're putting on them. Now, a kind of, some people ask me a kind of sub-question to this, is what about like custom metrics, right? What about things that either the platform isn't capturing, or maybe CPU, memory usage, garbage selection times, things like that? And I think the traditional way you've kind of captured custom metrics is you, in your infrastructure, you have some kind of runtime background agent that you install, which will run continuously polling for those metric values and then send them over to some kind of external monitoring service. And the challenge with serverless is that you get no access to the runtime environment, so you can't install things like background agents. So what do you do if you want to capture custom metrics from the platform? Now, the kind of the, the, the strategy or the trick or the hack that the service community has decided on to manage this kind of stuff um, is this. What you do is you have a runtime library that when your function gets invoked, will capture those values from the runtime and just logs them to standard out, to standard error. So they're automatically made available through the platform logs. And then to simulate having a, well, having a background agent, what you do is you have another serverless function that runs on a timer, so it runs every five minutes, every hour, every minute. When that function runs, it retrieves all of the platform logs that have been generated, it passes through for those custom metric values, and it will manually send them over to your logging infrastructures. You can kind of simulate having a background agent by having another serverless function which runs on a timer and pulls those values out and forwards this one. And I actually did this with a, a kind of service app I had. So I wanted to record all kinds of things around CPU and memory and garbage collection. And uh, yeah, I uh, basically used the runtime library to log it to standard out and add another function to send it over to IBM Cloud Monitoring, which is just hosted Grafana in the public cloud. And I could set up my dashboards and alerting and all this kind of stuff to get me out of bed if things started to go wrong. 
So when it comes to debugging, right, this is a bit of a hot topic at the moment when building service applications. You are kind of limited to slightly more primitive tools, things like um, uh, things like uh, like logs and metrics and maybe some kind of custom metrics. You're not going to be very easy to be able to connect your debuggers to those kind of environments. But if this sounds kind of slightly nasty to you, it's kind of putting you off, I would say just kind of hold on, right? Because I think in a couple of years, we'll have much better tooling support from the serverless providers. They all hear this developer problem that debugging is a big pain. I think in a couple of years, you're going to have much better tooling. But at the moment, you're going to be restricted to things like logs and metrics and other things they provide. Okay, so final question, right? Final question. And this is a question I think developers seem most worried about when they ask me. And they ask me this, right? Can you set a limit on the costs for your serverless application? Because one, I'm on stage kind of dancing around telling you how wonderful serverless is. You know, I say, you know, it's as much capacity as you want on demand. You just have to be able to pay for it. They think, well, what happens if I build a little application and I put it online? And somehow it gets onto like Slashdot or Hacker News or Product Hunt, and I get loads and loads of traffic. If I had a little server, the server would just like crash and set on fire, and that would be the end of the application. But with serverless, it's probably just going to scale and work fine, and then I'm going to get an enormous bill at the end of the month from my cloud provider. And I don't really want that to, to happen. And people, I think, when they are talking to me about serverless, they think that if we adopt service, more people adopt serverless, you're going to see scenarios like this. You're going to see uh, software developers in Silicon Valley in the street panhandling saying, please help me. I accidentally wrote a recursive service function, and now I need dollars for my cloud bill, right? Is this, is this something you've got to worry about, kind of bankrupting yourself with serverless? And what are some practical things you can put in place to kind of mitigate that risk? So the first thing to say about this is that actually serverless platforms do have limits. When you sign up for a new account, most providers limit the amount of kind of capacity you can use. And they limit you on two things to begin with. The first is what I call concurrent invocations. So how many service functions you can invoke at any one time. Most providers limit you to around 1,000 concurrent invocations kind of straight out of, the, straight out of the gate. And this is quite useful to accidentally stop uh, kind of over-provisioning accidentally or using recurrent functions, things like that. If you try and invoke more than that to begin with, the, the platform just kind of rates them at you, sends you back an error, you don't get charged. Now, this is a, what I call soft limit. If you raise a ticket with your cloud provider, they will increase that for you. But you know that's quite a lot of traffic to begin with, which is quite nice. The second thing they kind of limit you on is around processing time. So with your serverless functions, when it gets invoked with an API request or an event to process, most platforms limit you to between 10, now it's 10 and 15 minutes, to process that request. If you haven't finished after that time, the platform just kills off the process and returns an error. So if you were to push up a service function which had no return statement, when it gets invoked, it doesn't run forever and just run up an enormous bill. After 10 or 15 minutes, the platform just kills it off and returns you an error code. Uh, this is what we call a hard limit. This is a hard limit, so no providers at the moment allow you to increase that, but you know, it's quite a long time, especially since you can kind of parallelize the work. So both of these two things, right, the concurrency limit and the time limit, will probably stop you running up the bill the size of like a small country's GDP, but maybe it's still enough to do some damage to your company. So what are some practical tips we can put in place to stop you accidentally using too much capacity? Uh, and the first thing you can do is configure rate limiting for your public APIs. If you're building completely public endpoints with no authentication, I think it's a legitimate concern that either accidentally or maliciously people could send you too much traffic, kind of financial denial of service attack, and charge you kind of too much money. But if you're building public API endpoints, right, the way you expose those to the internet is through that API gateway service. And API gateways have rate limiting built in. So you can go into your configuration panel for the API gateway, and you just tick the box, and you say no more than like 100 requests a minute or a second. And if the API gateway gets more traffic than this, it just kind of turns it away, just returns a rate limiting error. You don't get called because your service functions don't get invoked. So this is a very like sensible, practical thing if you're building complete public endpoints points, please turn on rate limiting. And the second thing you can do is uh, set up automatic billing alerts. So most cloud providers allow you to go into your account configuration and set a kind of estimated monthly spend. And if your projected spend goes above that, what's going to happen is they're basically going to send you notifications so you can go into your cloud account and start to turn things off. 
So in the IBM Cloud account, you can see I can just go and say, OK, no more than $100 a month. If I, my projected spend gets above that, I'll start to get notification emails. I go in and start to see what is using all that capacity. So these five questions that I've talked about, right, they're generally, honestly, generally the most common questions I get asked again and again and again around serverless when I've kind of finished my uh, kind of talks or workshops or applications. But developers have loads of really, really other good questions around building serverless applications. Things like, how do you test serverless web apps? That's a great, like, question. That's pretty much a conference talk in its own. Um, how do you do dev test and production? How do you do this kind of CI, CD and without any, really having any servers and infrastructure? And also, when should you not use serverless? When is it not appropriate? What kind of workloads um, does it not really work for? And I could spend like all day talking about this kind of stuff, uh, but it's the end of my conference talk. So I was thinking, like, what kind of advice can I give you as an overall piece of advice to think about when you're building kind of serverless architectures that can help you answer your own questions, be your own stack overflow? Um, as it will. And the best thing I can think of, uh, best piece of advice I can think to leave you with is this, right? Remember to be lazy and embrace the cloud as much as possible, right? Maybe this is what I like serverless because I'm very lazy. Because when you're building serverless applications, often I think you're just building integration between different cloud services. Some people sometimes describe the functions as a service part of serverless as just the glue between those different cloud services. And serverless is all about getting away from managing infrastructure and running services yourself and kind of provisioning managing services in the cloud and just kind of gluing them together. So when you start to get these questions about like, where do I store files? Like, uh, what about my database? How how do I do logging? The best approach is to be lazy and think, OK, can my cloud provider do this for me? Is there some kind of managed service that I can provision, just take care of this? Or is there some external SaaS API or something like that I can bring in, or some other external API endpoint to do these kind of capabilities and really just focus on the business logic of your application and get far, far away from thinking about managing infrastructure anymore? So I think if you can kind of remember this advice, right, of being lazy and embracing all the cloud service and capabilities you have available, you will go a really, really long way to building serverless applications. Thank you very much.